It has been said that all the armies that have ever marched and all the navies that have ever sailed and all the kings that have ever reigned put together, they have not affected life on this planet more than the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And how true that is. But in our day, it seems like so many people think that Jesus is just one among many. That Christianity is one among many. But not so. Jesus is not just one among many. Jesus is in a league all his own. You see, no man ever said the things that Jesus said, but no man ever did the things that Jesus did. Talk is cheap. Jesus is about power. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is not just in talk, but in power. The difference between Jesus Christ and all the other religious leaders there have ever been is they're all about talk, but Jesus has the power. This is what the Gospels are all about. They're not just about the clear teaching of Jesus. They're about the might, the strength, the power of Jesus. They're not just about the preaching of Jesus. They're about the astounding power of our Savior. And sometimes I fear we as God's people forget how awesome our Savior is. And that is why we need to be often in the Gospels. That is why we ought to so love the Gospel of Mark. Because of all of the Gospels, it's the Gospel that focuses so much on the power of Jesus. Do you know in the Gospel of Mark, there are only four parables, but there are 19 miracles. <laughs> because everywhere you turn, you see the power of Jesus. And in the passage before us in Mark chapter 4 and chapter 5 tonight, there are four astounding miracles, four astounding demonstrations of the power of Jesus that we will see. We will see tonight that Jesus has the power over danger. We will see tonight that Jesus has the power over demons. We will see tonight that Jesus has the power over disease. And we will see tonight that Jesus has the power over death. No man ever liked Jesus, for no man had the power of Jesus. In Mark chapter 4 and chapter 5, the first thing that we see is about the astounding power of Jesus, his power over danger. It begins in Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, but to understand what is happening there, to understand what is happening in the passage before us tonight, we need to back up and look for a moment at Mark chapter 4 and verse 1. And again he, and again Jesus, began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat, and he sat on it by the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. The sea that is mentioned here is the Sea of Galilee. John mentioned that there's upcoming an Israel trip. If you ever get a chance to go to the land of Israel, go. It will change your life totally and completely. You will never, ever read the Bible the same again. The sea mentioned here is, of course, the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee is a pear-shaped lake. It's about 13 miles from the top of it to the bottom of it, and about eight miles across in average. And Jesus here is on the north 
northeast corner or the northwest corner of it in a city called Capernaum. And a great multitude of people have come to him, so many people that he goes out into the ocean in the boat and he begins to teach this great multitude of people. And all day long, he is teaching them. And Mark chapter 4 tells us some of the things that he was teaching them. He taught them a parable of a sower. And then he taught them a parable of a light and how it shouldn't be put under a basket. And he taught them a parable of a self-growing seed. And he taught them a parable about the mustard seed. And after he had taught them all of these things, then we see the power of Jesus. Because Jesus isn't just about teaching, he's about doing. In verse 35, and on this same day, after teaching all day long in the boat by the sea, on that northwest corner of the Sea of Galilee, on the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. There were other little boats that were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. As we will learn, Jesus was cutting across the top of the Sea of Galilee about a five-mile trip to the northeast side, to a place called Gadara, we'll talk about in a moment. And as he was cutting across, all of a sudden there was a great windstorm that came up. The Sea of Galilee is a beautiful place, but it is one of the most treacherous bodies of water on the face of the planet. And the reason why is because sudden storms can come up without any notice whatsoever. The Sea of Galilee is actually about 700 feet below sea level. And it's sort of in like a, a bowl. The, the, the hills and mountains rise around it about 1,400 feet. And what happens is just north of the Sea of Galilee, there's a mountain about the tall, as tall as Mount Baldy, Mount Hermon, 9,200 feet. And often there's snow on the top of it. And what happens is cold air comes down from the north from Mount Hermon, and then warm air comes from the east from the desert region, and the minute the cold air and the warm air hit, they start to swirl. And you can be out on the Sea of Galilee, it can be just like a sheet of glass, and within a few moments, all of a sudden, there are waves all over the place. And Jesus has been teaching all day, and now it is night, evening is set, and they begin to go across, and the Bible says there in verse 37, a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling the boat. Don't think the kind of boat that you see in, in a marina or the boat show. We actually know what kind of boat it was because in 1986, when the Sea of Galilee during a drought was very low, it just so happens that they discovered a 2,000-year-old boat in the mud. It's known as the Jesus Boat. And near Capernaum, you can go and see that boat today. It's quite an amazing sight to see a 2,000-year-old boat. It's about 27 feet long and only 7 half feet wide. And in that boat are 12 disciples and Jesus, 13 men. And the wind is howling, and the waves are coming up, and they're dumping down into this little tiny boat. Verse 38, but Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. <laughs> they tell us boats in those days, the last seat that was in the boat was reserved for the special guest, and it had a cushion on it. And Jesus, after teaching all day long, he was in the back of the boat sleeping. There's something so wonderful about that. Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man. Jesus knew what it was like to be tired, really tired, after working all day long. And there he was, asleep, but not just so sleepy because he was tired. He was trusting his father. 
He was trusting in God as we ought to in the storms of life that we face. Here's this great storm that comes up. And when experienced fishermen are freaking out, you know it's a big storm. <laughs> and Jesus is there in the stern of the boat. And they wake him up, verse 38 says, and they say, do you not care that we are perishing? Notice those words, do you not care? You've never said that. I've never said that. We've said it many times. In the storms of life that we go through, Lord, where are you? How, how come this came out of nowhere? My boat's filling up. Don't you see what I'm going through? Don't you care about what I'm going through, dear ones? I'm here to tell you tonight, God sees and God cares. But not only does God care, not only does Jesus care, he has the power to change what you're going through. They said, verse 38, do you not care that we are perishing? Then Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Notice verse 39, he rebuked the wind. That's an interesting term. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, that word rebuked was used of Jesus rebuking a demon, rebuking demons. And as we'll see, there is all reason to believe this particular storm was brought up by Satan who was trying to kill Jesus, who was trying to kill the disciples, who was trying to prevent Jesus from going across the sea to free a demon-possessed man. And Jesus gets up in the boat, and the Greek literally reads, He said to the wind, Be muzzled! Stop it! Peace be still! And it says immediately, verse 39, There was a great calm. This is astounding power <laughs> that immediately the Sea of Galilee is a great calm. Whenever I think of this miracle, whenever I think about what Jesus did, I, I think about what my boys and I used to do in the swimming pool. <laughs> I used to take my boys down to the swimming pool in the condo that we lived in and we would get the boogie boards in the pool and we would rock them back and forth and we would do cannonballs and we would try to get as, that, that water as many waves as we could possibly get them. And then we would get out of the pool and we would, like time, how long does it take before it calms down? A minute? Two minutes? Dear ones, that's not what happened here. Here is a howling storm. Here are these waves coming up. And Jesus says, peace be still. And instantly it was like glass. I have a word for that. Wow! Wow! What a Savior! What an amazing Jesus! Peace be still. And immediately there was a great calm. But verse 40, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Why is it you have no faith? See, there was a storm outside, but there was a storm inside too. Sometimes the greatest problem isn't what's outside of us. It's what's inside of us. It's the fear. It's the worry. It's the anxiety. And Jesus can not only calm the danger around you, he can calm your heart. He can calm the trouble that you feel, all of the waves that are crashing around inside of you sometimes, and nobody knows. And he can speak peace to your heart because he is the Prince of Peace. And tonight, some of you are going to experience that peace that passes understanding as the Savior speaks to your heart, and there's a calm that comes to your heart. Oh, Jesus says to them, why are you so fearful? 
How is it that you have no faith? Don't you know who I am? Don't you understand the power that I have to work in your life and to work through your life? Well, what happened? Verse 41. And they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, Who can this be? That even the wind and the sea obey him. One among many teachers? I don't think so. You got the wrong Jesus. The power of Jesus, the astounding power of Jesus, it left the disciples in breathless amazement when they, they wondered and looked at him. Who can this be? This Jesus, there's nobody like this Jesus. I don't know as we gather tonight, what danger you might be in. I don't know tonight as we gather what storm you might be in that has suddenly come up upon your life and inside your heart is just churning with turmoil like the waves of the sea. All I know is I felt I was supposed to come and remind you tonight about the astounding power of Jesus, that he has power over those circumstances in your life and he can bring peace to your heart. But Jesus in the passage before us not only has power over danger, number two, he has power over demons. He has power over demons. In Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 20, we find the most extreme, severe case of demon possession in all of the Bible. Do you know as you read through the Gospels and you ask yourself the question, what is the number one miracle that Jesus did in terms of its numerical frequency? What miracle did Jesus do more than any other miracle? Answer to your question, casting out of demons. In 1 John 3 and verse 8, the Bible is clear. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy, that he might demolish the works of the devil. People in Jesus' day, the disciples in Jesus' day, they were fearful of dangerous storms, but they were also fearful of demons. And they needed to understand that Jesus has the power over Satan, that Jesus has the power over demons. Even the most extreme demon possession case, case that you can ever even wrap your mind around. In Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Some translations say Gadara. Capernaum, I mentioned, is on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. You cut five miles across the top of the Sea of Galilee, and on the northeast corner, there's a place called Gad, Gad, Gadara. If you know the Bible, you know in the Old Testament there was a tribe of Israel called the tribe of Gad. And when Joshua led the people of God into the promised land, there were three groups, Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh, who said, we don't want to cross over into the promised land. We'd rather live on the other side of the land of Jordan. And so Joshua said, okay. It's a picture in the Bible of people who are so close to the blessing of God, but don't fully enter in. And they're not fully entering in, led to a way of compromise. And so that area of Gad, that area of Gadara, became a place where Jews there were compromising and where Gentiles would move in and take over. There were 10 cities over there called Decapolis, Decapolis, 10 cities. And it was a pagan area it was a place of evil, as we will see. It was a place of darkness. And Satan had brought up a storm to try to prevent Jesus from getting there. But Jesus went through all of that for one man. To free one person who was bound by the devil. And it just shows the lengths Jesus will go to to free any person from whatever they are bound by. Verse 1 again, And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, 
Immediately there met him a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. Stop there for a moment. He left, listen, he left Capernaum when it was evening. They went across the Sea of Galilee in the darkness. They come ashore in the darkness. And all of a sudden, an unclean man in an unclean place comes roaring out of the darkness with an unclean spirit, with unclean spirits in him, a man so severely bound by the devil. An unclean spirit, this is another word, this is another description of what the Bible calls a demon. A demon, what are demons? Well, they're fallen angels. When Satan rebelled in heaven, he took a third of the angels away with him. And those fallen angels are sometimes called evil spirits or unclean spirits or demons. And demons, they seek to inhabit people so they can destroy the lives of people, so they can destroy the works of God. And this man somehow, some way, had opened the door to the devil. We know from the Bible that a Christian can never be demon-possessed because my body, your body as a Christian, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God, the Holy Spirit, and the devil don't share the same house. They just don't. When the devil knocks on the door of a Christian, God, the Holy Spirit, answers the door and says, Not welcome here. <laughs> Not welcome here. But this man wasn't a believer. He didn't have the protection of God on his life. And somehow, in some way, what was through anger or bitterness, whether it was through jealousy or whether it was through witchcraft or paganism, he had opened the door to the devil. And people can do that even in our own day with things so innocent as a horoscope or the Ouija board. They can open the door to the devil. And when you open the door to the devil, when you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And that one demon that came in and brought others and others and others and others. And Matthew chapter 12, Jesus told a story about a man who had a demon. He told the story, it's like a house and the person's put out of the house and it gets all swept and clean. But then the demon roams around in the desert and brings back seven more and comes back in. And it's worse than in the beginning. And this man had welcomed in these unclean spirits. He was living in an unclean place with all of these dead bodies among the tombs. And he comes roaring out of the darkness. And verse 3 says, And he had been dwelling among the tombs so that no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had been often bound with shackles. Those are things on your feet and chains, literally handcuffs, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Stop there for a moment. I mean, he was so violent, so possessed by these demons, so evil. Society could do nothing but try to isolate him. There's no help. There's nothing we can do for this person. So they tried to restrain him. But no matter how many times they put handcuffs on him, he just ripped them up. No matter how many times they put shackles on his feet, he just broke them away. And the reason why is because people who are possessed by demons often have extreme power. Our pastor, Raul Reese, many of you know, is a black belt in Kung Fu. And he tells a story one time about how they were at a retreat and several of the Calvary pastors, I think Pastor David was with him. There was this little tiny lady and she was possessed by a demon. And so they went in to pray for her and she like picked up one of them, just threw him against the wall. And here was this man. No one could restrain him. Listen, often, notice that word. They tried to restrain him again and again and again, and no one could detain him. Verse 5, and always, 
night and day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, literally screaming and cutting himself with stones. Day and night, he's running around insane, out of his mind, so violent, screaming and cutting himself with stones. It's interesting when you read the Old Testament and you remember the story of Elijah up on Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal started cutting themselves. In our day, there are people who cut themselves. It's the devil trying to destroy people. It's the devil trying to ruin people, but he was cutting himself. The word in Greek for cutting literally means to cut down. Likely it means he kept trying to commit suicide. He kept trying to take his own life. Listen, this is what the devil will do to a person. You give him an inch, he will take a mile. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy Satan was destroying this man. Society could do nothing for this man. But Jesus, oh, Jesus can set anyone free, no matter how bound they are, no matter what darkness they're in. Here he comes, screaming out of the darkness, out of the tombs. In verse 6, and when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran. And he worshipped him. Somehow, somehow in that moment, this poor man who was so bound by the devil realized, Jesus could free me. And he ran to him for help. And all of a sudden, those demons inside of him, they gained control again. They began to speak out of him. Verse 8. And he cried out with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God, do not torment me. Why did they say that? Why did he say that? Verse 8, For Jesus had said to, the, to, to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Oh, Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Here this man, he wanted to be free. All of a sudden, those demons inside of him began to speak out. They recognized who Jesus was. I find it so interesting. Some people in our day, well, Jesus never did he was the son of God. <laughs> the demons are smarter than them. Some liberal theologians, well, Jesus was human. He wasn't really divine. The demons are smarter than them. They knew exactly who Jesus was. You are the Son of God. They said this because Jesus said, come out of him. And there's some struggle going on there because they said, don't torment us. Oh, just to be in the presence of Jesus. Just to sense the power of Jesus was tormenting to them. And Jesus, oh, this is amazing. Verse 9, he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, one of the demons speaking for the others said, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion, everybody in that day knew what a legion was. A legion was a group of Roman soldiers. 6,826 Roman soldiers was a legion. 6,100 of them were footmen. 726 of them were horsemen. Our name is Legion, for we are many. We take the Bible at face value. We believe what the Bible says. There is no good reason not to believe this man was inhabited with 6,000 demons. You talk about a case of demon possession. You talk about a person being bound by the devil. No person ever so bound 
by the devil. And you can imagine hearing six, there are many, all of these demons screaming out in torment. I don't know what the disciples were doing right now. I think I'd be freaking out. <laughs> wow. I'd be hiding behind Jesus for sure. For we are many, they said. Verse 10, and he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. In Luke 8 and verse 31, it says that he would not send them into the pit that he would not send them into the abyss because that's the place that demons are going to go. And they knew the power of Jesus to immediately send them to where they're going to be judged forever. They understood who Jesus was. 6,000 demons are begging him, please, please, please. Who's in charge here? Satan? Who's in charge here? The demons? No. Jesus is in charge. They're pleading with him, please, please do not send us to that place of judgment now. Verse 11, now a large, a large swine of pigs were feeding near the mountains there. A large, large herd of, of swine, a large herd of pigs. How many of them? Well, we'll see in a moment, 2,000 of them. Now, that's very significant whether you realize it or not. Because over there on that northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee, to have that large a group of pigs was not a good thing. If you know the Bible, you know that pigs are not kosher. <laughs> They're unclean animals. But those unclean animals were used in pagan worship. The Canaanites used pigs in their worship. The Babylonians used pigs in their worship. The Egyptians used pigs in their worship. To them, listen, to them, a pig was what a lamb was to a Jew. In fact, the Greeks sacrificed pigs to their goddess Aphrodite. The Romans sacrificed pigs to their god Zeus. I asked you a good question. This is Calvary Cappuccini Valley. You, you, you guys are students of the Bible. I asked you a good question. What are 2,000 pigs doing in the land of Israel? What in the world are they doing there? Why would the Jews allow these un so many unclean animals there? Because they had so compromised. This was a wicked, evil place. Verse 14, so those who fed the swine, I'm sorry, uh, so verse 9, he asked them, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. He also begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large, verse 11, a large swine of, uh, a herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all, notice that, all the demons begged him. Can you imagine 6,000 demons all saying, send us to the swine, send us to the swine. Send us to the pigs. I mean, what a scene. So all the demons, verse 12, begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And the other gospels tell us that Jesus said one word. Go! Oh, the power of Jesus. Oh, the power of Jesus. Jesus wasn't struggling and begging, well, please go out of him, please go out of him, go! And 6,000 demons immediately go out of the man and into the pigs. Why? Because demons want to inhabit bodies so they can bring destruction. And here these unclean spirits go into these unclean animals. Somebody said it was the first case of deviled ham. Unbelievable. What happened? Well, verse 12, so all the demons begged him, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And once Jesus gave them permission, he said, go. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, do the, your math students too, 6,000 demons, 2,000 pigs. That means three demons per pig. Wow, this is crazy. And the herd ran violently down the steep place 
into the sea and drowned in the sea. When you go to that place called Gadara, you see the cliffs that are there and you can imagine it in your mind. Here are these demon-possessed pigs. Oh, they're going down and they drown out into the sea. All the power of Jesus over the devil. All the power of Jesus over demons. Verse 14, so those who fed the swine fled and they told it to the city in the country and they went out to see what had happened and they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon possessed and had been had the legion. He was sitting and clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. What happened here? All of our collective effort couldn't restrain this man and now he's free. And those, verse 16, who saw it, told him how it happened to him, how he'd been demon-possessed and about the swine. They didn't want to get in trouble. So verse 17, they began to plead with him to depart from their region. How sad. How sad. Instead of rejoicing over the freedom of this man, they were so concerned about their pigs. How sad. Verse 18, and when he had got into the then they, verse 17, then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. In verse 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. In other words, Jesus, I just want to follow you. You've set me free. I just want to be with you. Where you go, I want to go. Where you stay, I want to stay. I just want to be with you. Verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him. Jesus said no to the man's prayer. It's interesting. <laughs> he answered the pleading of the demons. He answered the pleading of the villagers, but he said no to this man's prayer. Sometimes when God says no, it's for a greater purpose. And he said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim. He began to preach in the capitalists, the 10 cities, all that Jesus had done for him and all, what? Powerful. They were astounded. They were amazed. Oh, the astounding power of Jesus. He has power over danger. He has power over demons, but he also has power over disease. As you begin reading in verse 21, now when Jesus had crossed over again by the boat to the other side. So look up here for a moment. He's up here in Gadara. He gets back in the boat and crosses back to Capernaum. I find it so amazing. He goes all that way for one person. Jesus will do all of that so one person can be free. It just shows you the links Jesus will go to. But he goes back to Capernaum, and when he comes back to shore, there's a great multitude who have gathered to him, and he was by the sea. He comes to the shore, and all these people start thronging out. But among that crowd are two individuals. Jesus always sees the individual. You're in a big group tonight, but Jesus knows your heart. He knows all you're going through. And the two people that he sees are so different. One's a man, one's a woman. One, his name we know, the other one we don't know. One was well known, he was a ruler. The other one was unknown. One was rich, one was poor. One had a daughter who was 12 years old. The other had a disease for 12 years. And Jesus will see, minister to both of them. Jesus is a whosoever will may come Savior. No matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, Jesus sees it. And he's going to meet you right at that point of need. So verse 20 one, and Jesus crossed over again by the boat to the other side, and a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. 
And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and he begged him earnestly. And this, this took great humility. This man was well known. This man was respectable. This man had position and affluence and influence. And now he is down on the dirt, begging at the feet of Jesus. Well, he's doing that so desperately because he has a desperate heart. Verse 23, he begged him earnestly, my little daughter, she lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. And so Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. You see it? Jesus comes ashore, there's a great multitude there, and out of the crowd comes the most well-known person in their town, and he falls down in front of the feet of Jesus. Please, 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 my daughter, precious little girl. She's about to die, and so Jesus says, okay, and he gets up, and the crowd starts to move, and as they're moving along, verse 25, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and she'd suffered many things from many physicians and she spent all that she had and she was no better but she grew worse she had a flow of blood she had some sort of uterine hemorrhage and she was bleeding constantly for 12 years wow that's an extreme case but no case too extreme for Jesus for 12 years, not only was she physically weak, but because of that constant bleeding, it made her ceremonially unclean. Because according to Le Leviticus chapter 15, a person who had that kind of disease, a person who had that kind of illness, could not be around other people, could not be a part of the community of God, could not come to worship with the people of God, could not touch her family, could not touch her friends. You couldn't even sit down where she had sat before, totally isolated. Can you imagine no one even touching you for 12 years? And she had suffered many things from many physicians. She'd gone to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor. The Talmud says that there were 11 different ways that they would try to cure these people. And believe me, the ways they tried to cure them were insane, were bizarre. And she not only was suffering physically, and not only was she suffering emotionally, she'd gone from doctor to doctor to doctor, and she'd spent all of her money. It says here she'd spent all of her money on physicians, and she just got worse and worse and worse. Oh, I like this. Verse 27, and when she heard, when she heard about Jesus. Oh, what a Savior. When she heard about Jesus, she heard about the power of Jesus. She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment where she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I may be well. You see it? She's out on the periphery of the crowd. She's really not even supposed to be there around those people, but she saw the crowd, and maybe she said to somebody, what's, what's this crowd? And somebody said, Jesus is here. She'd heard about Jesus. She may have seen him from a distance, and she got down on her hands and knees and began to crawl among all the legs of the people. She thought, if I could just... Just touch the hem of his garment. Such faith. Such faith. You know, some people here tonight will touch Jesus. Will reach out in faith. She just reached out to touch the hem of his garment. Verse 30, or verse 29. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. 
as the Sea of Galilee instantly went calm, as the demon-possessed man instantly was freed, now instantly this precious lady is healed of this chronic illness that she had. And all of a sudden, she could feel it in her body, all of the strength restored to her body. But verse 30, immediately Jesus, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Verse 31, but his disciples said to him, uh, you see the multitude thronging around you and you say, who touched me? Are you crazy, Jesus? I mean, everybody's touching you. But it's possible to touch Jesus and not touch Jesus. She had faith. She believed. I know who Jesus is if I can just get to Jesus. He's got the answer for me. And Jesus instantly knew she'd been healed. Verse 32, and he turned around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Here's the thing. Jesus knows all things. I believe Jesus knew exactly who it was who had been healed. But Jesus drew her out of the crowd. Say, why did he do that? Listen, for her sake, to restore her to her family and her friends and to give praise and honor and glory to God. He called her out and he said, oh, my daughter, my daughter, you've been healed. Dear ones, I don't know all that you might be going through in your life tonight. Maybe it's danger. Maybe it's a person you know who's bound by Satan or demons who's in such darkness, or maybe it's some disease. All I know is Jesus has the power over that, but he not only has power over danger and demons and disease, he even has power over death, our greatest enemy. And that's what we see in verse 35 to 42. Verse 35, and while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house. He was the chief ruler. And they said to him, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. Just believe. You saw what I just did. You saw what happened to this woman. Don't be afraid, just believe. Verse 37, And Jesus permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he came into the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he saw a tumult of those who wept and wailed loudly. Often, and even today, they would bury the person the very same day that they died. They would hire these professionals to make a big scene of it, and they would tear their clothes, and they would scream out, and they would wail and they had music playing and Jesus comes and it's a scene and when he he had come in verse 39 says he said why make this commotion and weep the child is not dead but sleeping and they ridiculed him but when he had put them all outside he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and where the child was lying and he took the child by the hand and he said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, get up. Immediately. Immediately the sea went calm. Immediately the demons went out. Immediately the disease was gone. And immediately... The girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. Jesus even had power over death. You remember the story of Lazarus who had been dead for four days, and Jesus went. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
who, who lives and believes in me he never really dies. He never really dies because Jesus conquered death so that we will pass through death immediately into the presence of God. Jesus has power over death, but not only physical death, all kinds of death. He has power over a dead marriage. He has power over a dead job. He has power over a dead circumstance or a dead situation. Jesus has the power, such astounding power, that there was great amazement. Dear ones, as we gather together tonight, I don't know all that's happening in your life. I just know when I was praying about what to share. God just put it on my heart, go, go over there to Chino Valley and remind them about the power of Jesus. Whatever dangerous storm you're in, he's the master of that storm. No matter how bound a person is in sin and darkness, by drugs or alcohol or sexual addiction, Jesus can set that person free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. No matter what disease it is, Jesus is the great physician and he has the power over that. And he has the power even over death. Oh, the astounding power of Jesus. I like I like what Jesus said to the Father at the end of this chapter. Two words. Only believe. Only believe. Only believe. When I was a small boy growing up in church in our Sunday morning Bible classes, they taught us a little song. It was called, Only Believe. I finish with the words of that simple song, Only Believe, Only Believe, All Things Are Possible. Only Believe.